and welcome to Sci-Fi September. Woo! I hope you liked that little intro. I goofed around at it pretty hard. So all this month, we are going to look at science fiction book series. I'm going to introduce five different uh, big science fiction book series to you, spoiler free, to help you decide what you want to read, because we are all about celebrating reading around here. Also, I hope you like the space mural. My talented wife, Kit, put this together. Not specifically for Sci-Fi September, it was already on the wall, but doesn't it look nice? To start this monthly theme, we are going right back to 1965's Dune by Frank Herbert, which is only fitting because this book has had a huge influence on science fiction since then. I mean, the whole desert planet thing has been done so many times. I mean, we're all familiar with that empty, barren wasteland full of scum and villainy that's completely unsuitable for human living, like Tatooine from Star Wars, Clendathu from Starship Troopers, or Sydney, Australia. <laughs> so here's the thing, most people who read Dune will only really read the first book. So the question is today, do you want to try out the whole series? Or are you a total newbie and you're not even sure if one book is right for you? <laughs> That's okay too. Let's deep dive into the sands of Arrakis and breathe in the sweet melange within. But first, an important distinction. <laughs> Yeah, you've probably already noticed it, but I pronounce it as Dune. Most Americans will pronounce it as Dune, as in... Tonight at 11. Doom! So I'll address this up front before I irritate everyone, but just so you know. I'm Australian, we generally use UK English, not US English. In the US, you would pronounce these words as do, nu, and dune. In the UK and Australia, we add a Y sound, so we would pronounce it as du new and dune so for the rest of the video i'm going to call this series dune but you are welcome to call it dune i hope you can live with how i'm going to do it <laughs> he who controls the spice controls the universe Paul Atreides is the heir to a noble house. His family was given the great task by the Emperor himself to manage and steward the planet Arrakis. So this desert wasteland planet is also the only place in the universe where you can find melange, known as the spice. The spice is essential for galactic travel and for the ability to see into the future. Yet this puts House Atreides into a very precarious position. Every other major house wants what they have. And young Paul soon finds himself facing the possible destruction of everything he's known and loved. Yet Paul is only at the start of this journey towards a great, unimaginable destiny. Something that reaches far beyond the simple desert planet and into the future of humanity itself. By the way, has anyone recognized my shirt yet? Yeah? Classic sci-fi. Top tier, right? You guys came. Who wants the grand tour? Now, I'd love to talk about the world building here, or in this case, the, uh, the universe building. But for June, it all kind of feels like spoilers. Let me explain. June has such a heavy emphasis on world building. When I read the first novel, I felt like 50% of it was just world building and only 50% was actual story. I was even thinking, geez, when's the story gonna start? Oh look, more world building. And look, more lumber spread. Now to be fair, it is excellent world building. The June universe is very well thought out and hyper realistic as much as it can be in lieu of giant sandworms and all. In fact, a lot of Dune's world building has been copied elsewhere. That's how influential it is. We see it copied in the barren wastelands in Mass Effect, Halo, and Canberra, Australia. <laughs> so the world building is great stuff. I'm a little reluctant to introduce it too much of it here because that will ruin what the book spends so much of its time on. But I do want to get you interested in it. So here's a brief little snippet of some world building facts to get you interested in reading more. So Dune is set 20,000 years into Earth's future. Uh, humanity has spread all through the galaxy, but humanity is also now one empire ruled by an imperial family and governed by dozens of aristocratic noble houses. And these houses are constantly fighting each other for galactic dominance. Now, about 10,000 years before the story started, robots and AI became way too powerful and more or less controlled all of humanity. There was a great religious jihad in which humanity spent two whole generations fighting and destroying every last computer in existence. 
Now there is zero computers or AI lest they take control again. So the world of Dune is very advanced, but it's also not that advanced in certain ways, if that makes sense. Side note, that's also why the year in Dune is always around the 10,000 year mark, because it was 10,000 years since the destruction of computers, but it is actually 20,000 years into Earth's future. Just so you know. Nowadays the world of Dune relies on two big things to replace computers, and these two things are the linchpin of all of Dune's society. The first is incredible mind training. So some humans learn intense control over their own mind and achieve all sorts of weird and wonderful powers. Uh, some are trained to drive ships through uh, the galaxy without a computer to plot its course, so they do the advanced mathematic calculations to plot a course. Foremost among these mentally enhanced people are the group known as the Bene Gesserit. So they're an all-women group uh, who are brilliant manipulators of human behavior. So they're often called witches because they can use the power of voice and tone and, and wording to subtly influence your mind without you realizing it. The second big thing that replaces computers is the spice from Arrakis. So the desert planet Dune, known as Arrakis to the locals, is a barren wasteland with almost no water and mostly sand. Uh, yet these unique conditions have allowed these giant sandworms to evolve, and these sand Sandworms naturally produce large amounts of spice. The spice is used in ships for instantaneous travel across the galaxy, so all transport relies on it. And also it does have the whole, you know, psychedelic uh, additions as well, so it does not increase uh, prescience and gives people glimpses of the future. Hence the famous line, he who controls the spice controls the universe. So those were the few key world building details. Uh, if it sounds interesting to you, you should read Dune, because it delves into those a lot more than that. Now yes, there is a huge emphasis on world building in the first Dune novel, and there are two reasons for that. The first of which, fantasy and sci-fi were still being looked down upon by the general population. I mentioned this a little bit in my Earthsea video because that was written around the same time. There was a lot of literary snobbery in people looking down on these two genres, so people who wrote in these genres had a bit of a retaliatory push to add greater science and intelligence to their work to give it greater credibility. Many sci-fi writers in particular were doing a lot of work to show hard science behind their story, to give just more legitimacy to what they were doing. The second reason why it focuses so much on world building, Frank loved deserts. So you like cats? Sam. What? Dude shows up dressed like a cat, you don't want to know more? He worked in a desert for a time. So a little bit of background on the author himself, Frank was a journalist. In fact, he started very young. He even lied about his age to get his first journalist job at the age of 18. Now in 1959, he was 29 years old and his magazine assigned him the job of writing an article about the sand dunes in Oregon. The sand dunes gave him a certain idea. It was June. <laughs> And at this stage, Frank's wife Beverly was uh, working in advertisement and she became the main breadwinner. He reduced his hours so he had time to start writing his first novel. He spent six years researching sand dunes and writing this story. Kind of an intense fascination. He did start publishing the story as a serial in a sci-fi magazine. And once the serial was completed, he went to different publishers to publish it as a book. But he got rejected over 20 times. No one wanted to touch it. Even when it was published, it wasn't very successful, not right away. Three years after the book had been published, he had only made about $20,000, which means fewer than 10,000 copies had been sold. But he kept writing. In the 70s he had a little bit more success because he was putting out more books, but it was really the David Lynch Dune film in 1981 that made Dune a household name. Frank suddenly became a millionaire and all that kind of stuff. He passed away less than five years later. The guy was nearly unappreciated in his time. I am a little bit off topic, but the point is Frank was really interested in deserts, hence the heavy world building emphasis. <laughs> So Dune the First is a classic. Even if you don't read all of the Frank Herbert series, Dune the First is just an excellent novel. It stands the test of time and it is a classic for a reason. So the story focuses hard on Paul Atreides. Uh, at first he's dealing with kind of a strained relationship with both of his parents. Both have high expectations of what they want him to be, but both have different expectations to add greater complexity. Uh, so his father, uh, Leto, wants him to be the heir of um, House Atreides and rule the family 
family after he's gone. His mother Jessica is one of those Bene Gesserit women and she has her own agenda. So the women of the Bene Gesserit have been uh, selectively breeding for centuries. They are taking the best of people, pairing them up and trying to create the ultimate human, the ultimate mind, known as the uh, Kisach Haderach. Now Jessica did break the cycle of selective breeding when she married for love, but she does have a plan through Paul to get it back on track. We also have the villainous Harkonnens, led by the Baron Harkonnen. Uh, he is Jessica's father, and he's still pretty mad at her for spitting in his face, rejecting being the heir of his empire, and marrying Leto for love. So the Baron Harkonnen wants to destroy the House Atreides in revenge. There's a lot of these noble houses warring with each other. Uh, there's also the Fremen, the local population of Arrakis. They live in the dunes, almost worship the sandworms. Uh, the Fremen have been on this planet a long time. They are suddenly dealing with noble houses with extreme technological prowess, uh, laying claim to their planet, basically colonizing it. However, the Fremen have a prophecy that a great messiah and liberator will one day free them from their oppressors, the chosen one known as Muabdib. You guys get where this story is going, right? I mean, the Bene Gesserit have a chosen one, and the Fremen have a chosen one, and our protagonist is a white male. Yeah, yeah, you see where this is going. <laughs> So I've introduced book one pretty thoroughly at this point, but I'm going to do a little bit more before I go on to the wider series because I want to do a quick overview of the characters of book one so that uh, it will add a bit of context when I go through later in the series. You'll see, just trust me. So the main character is Paul Atreides, old mate. He's our classic protagonist. Uh, to be honest, he's a bit of a blank slate character. He almost has no real personality because he's a viewpoint protagonist. We are all Paul. Uh, his mother Jessica, a bit of an ice queen character. She's calm, controlled, unflappable in the worst of circumstances. She's the expert manipulator. Paul's father Leto, uh, head of House Atreides and uh, something of a workaholic. He never has time for family and his son in particular, but he's also a good man and a generous man. He works really hard to build a uh, functional and equal relationship with the Fremen people. Uh, instead of just forcing his way onto them like his predecessor. Uh, then we have Duncan, who's like Leto's right-hand man. Uh, and he's a sword master. He tutors Paul for most of his life. Duncan was Frank Herbert's favorite character uh, because Duncan is the everyday man. I'm just a simple man trying to make my way in the universe. He's the most basic people. He's surrounded by the super powerful and the super intelligent, but he's just Duncan. I'm just Duncan. The Baron Harkonnen is uh, the most quintessential aristocratic villain. Uh, he's brilliant, shrewd, greedy as hell. Uh, he's also extremely overweight, and the book takes every chance it gets to mention that. It's kind of awkward. I mean, it even says that he wears anti-gravity technology on his body so that it lifts him enough so he can still walk. That seemed unnecessary. And the Fremen, uh, Shani. Uh, she's the beautiful, mysterious Chani Shani. I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, so she's the beautiful, mysterious Enigma character. Uh, slash freedom fighter, that's kind of it. Now I'm going to level a little bit of criticism at June here, okay? So the character work in June, it's pretty basic. You're basic. It's quite stereotypical. There are a lot of archetype characters. Instead of real people, they're very one-dimensional. There's not a lot of brilliant character work in this series all the way through. Now, don't hate me, Dune fans, okay? Uh, I know many of these characters are beloved. Keep in mind, characters don't have to be complicated for us to love them. We are Simple characters can still work in stories. Simple characters can still tell the story and get the audience invested. Uh, simple does not mean poorly written. The characters are simple in Dune because there's such a heavier emphasis on bigger sci-fi concepts and uh, a plot that is staggeringly epic. Think of it like a D&D character who's put all of his stats into two categories and left others completely flat. That's a little bit what Dune is like. So again, there's not a lot of emphasis on character work. It's kind of okay, but it can be disappointing if that's what you'd usually look for in stories. Okay, finally, let's look past book one into the rest of the series. All right, so there's six books in the Frank Herbert Dune series. They pair off really nicely into twos. So that's how I'm gonna introduce them two by two. So Dune Messiah, book two, continues on directly from the first 
book. It is about 12 years later, but it continues the story of Paul Atreides. It's a much shorter book. I have heard people describe it as essentially an extended epilogue for the first book, and I think that description kind of checks out. At this point, Paul has grown ex exponentially in power, but he's worried now that he has too much power. Paul uses the spice to glimpse the far future, and he starts seeing glimpses of the Golden Path. Apparently the Golden Path is the only way to ensure humanity completely survives and never faces extinction. However, Paul knows that there is a high cost to be paid to reach this path, and he's not sure if he can do it. Alright, so here's the thing. Where the first book was really focused on big epic sci-fi, the second one is strangely, it's all about Paul trying to have an heir for his family. It is so much smaller in scale, and that kind of makes it anticlimactic. The story does fit a much shorter book, but it's so much more limited than its predecessor. I was actually researching bad sequels for this video for a different reason, and I organically came across Dune Messiah, a list of one of the most disappointing sequels of all time. Now, I don't think it's the worst. The worst! But I understand why some people would say that. It is so much smaller compared to Dune, but without giving spoilers, it resolves the story of Paul Atreides. So if you like Paul at this stage, you should read book two. So books three and four are pretty heavily linked. Uh, book three, Children of Dune, is about Paul's children. I mean, that's not a spoiler, right? Like, you could work that out from the title. Yeah. So Paul has twins, his son Leto II, and his daughter Ganema. These two have their father's prescience. They discover the same golden path Paul did, and together as children, they start playing a game to dramatically shift the future of the entire human race. And that leads us to the big one. The big one. God Emperor of Dune, book four. Let me put this really simply. Book 4 is the best of the sequels, hands down. It's the only one to come even close to the greatness of the original book. It is also the weirdest. Like, strap yourselves in for a whole lot of weird. Bobbity, bobbity, blah, blah, scoobity, doo, doo, blah. <laughs> I try not to give too many of my opinions on this channel, believe it or not, this is me trying, but I'm going to give one here. If you do decide to read past book one, I strongly recommend trying to read up to book four, because book four is the point of the entire Dune saga. The story itself, it's about one of those children uh, fulfilling the prophecies and becoming the chosen one. Muab'dib, the Kisach Haderach, everything. Becoming the immortal god emperor and reigning for three and a half thousand years. Yes, this book is set three and a half thousand years later where the God Emperor rules all of the known universe and has become a tyrant beyond all reason. Uh, how would you describe her? Hey, scary beyond all reason. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, this book is off the chain nuts. Three and a half thousand years later, so all the characters you knew from the earlier series, they are no longer around. The only character from the original book is a clone of Duncan. This is because Frank Herbert's favourite character was Duncan, so he just kept finding ways to put Duncan all the way through the series. I mean, sure, why not? So yeah, book four is a bit hard because it's a completely new cast of characters at this point, uh, but this is also where all the big themes of Dune come to fruition. And the big question is, is the tyrannical god emperor truly a tyrant? Or are they still trying to set humanity on this golden path to eventually save it? And then the next question is how much evil can be justified in the salvation of humanity? Okay, so the last two books, they are set 1,500 years after God Emperor, and that makes it a full 5,000 years since the original three, so it's a pretty significant time jump again. Once again, all the characters are gone except more clones of Duncan. Because why not? He's great. So a new conflict has arisen for these two books. Uh, the Order of the Bene Gesserit have split into multiple factions that are now in a form of like religious war. There's a lot of new characters, a lot of uh, mental enhancement fighting, a lot of manipulations, backstabbing, betrayals, etc. The world building has also changed in pretty slight but interesting ways over the 5,000 year time. I'm going to be really honest with you. I found these two books to be boring and forgettable. Like when I was researching this video, I had to go and reread summaries of these two books to even remember what happened. And that's normally not a problem for me. This is because the quality of the writing drops off hard at this point. So the general advice among the Dune fandom is you can read these two books if you at this point just love Dune and just love Frank, but 
kind of don't expect much, but be warned. Book 6 ends with a cliffhanger. It's a pretty big cliffhanger too. Frank was intending to write another book, the almighty 7th June novel, that was actually going to cap it all off. Unfortunately, he died rather suddenly, wasn't able to write it. But that leads us to... Man, I swear I've never had a bigger elephant in one of these rooms. This is a big one. And I gotta be real careful to not get sued for slander and defamation. So after Frank died, his son Brian started writing more Dune novels. In the last 35 years since Frank's death, Brian has written nearly 20 Dune novels. Let me outline the timeline for you here. So Brian started writing his own original stories in 1981, while his father was still alive. He wrote 10 novels, and all of them were, let's just say, commercially and critically unsuccessful. So in 1999, he teamed up with writer Kevin J. Anderson, and they both started writing Dune books together. Now these books were still getting, shall we say, mixed reviews, but they were commercially more successful, and they wrote six Dune novels. Then they announced that they had found secret notes from the author, 20 years after he had passed, in a locked safe that outlined his secret final novel. And so they wrote his secret novel based off leftover notes. <laughs> what a what a lucky coincidence that was, yeah. Look, I'm not saying it was just a cash grab. But coincidentally, they did split this final novel into two parts. And as we all know, it has never been a cash grab to split a story into two parts. Mm. Oh, that's not so much. Mm. So... All up, Brian and Kevin have now written a total of 18 Dune novels. And yeah, that does technically mean there are 24 Dune novels. Uh, but as you can see, they all have the word Dune, big and clear, so you don't miss it. Just in case you weren't sure if it was connected to the Dune universe. I'm just stating facts here. With the tone. Terry had a tone. Big time tone. Now, when I was researching this video, I did consider reading those two novels by Brian and Kevin that, you know, finished Frank's story. I thought they had a reputation, but I could try it and see. Instead, I just read a summary and let's say I was flabbergasted. I mean, spoilers, but the first thing they do is literally clone and resurrect every character from the series. Even the ones that have been 5,000 years dead. So this makes it sound like fan fiction. Now let me be clear on something. I don't ever want to speak poorly on fan fiction. I think it's a legitimate form of storytelling and it should be celebrated. What I do have a problem with is when authors and companies and studios write fan fiction and then lie to our faces and tell us it's the real thing. Because this action's pretty common and it reduces art and storytelling into a capitalist commodity that is only useful for profit. It always makes art lesser for it. So fan fiction is when we love the art and we want to participate in creating more of it. Fake fan fiction is when you try to trick people out of their money. It's more common than you might think. Mm. Oh, that's not so much. Mm. So... <laughs> Sorry for getting a bit worked up on that one. Apparently that's a trigger for me. Yeah, apparently. So I never want to tell you what you should and should not read. But I'm just going to state for the record, I don't ever intend to read a Brian Herbert novel. Earlier, I said that Dune does not have a lot of deep character work. And I stand by that. But Dune still has a lot to say about being human. Dune is packed full of big themes. One of the biggest themes is power. <laughs> So Frank very much wrote Dune as a warning of power in uh, the forms of too much individual power and government power. So just check out these two quotes from the author himself, quotes that were taken from him in interviews where he discussed his work. All governments suffer a recurring problem. Power attracts pathological personalities. It is not that power corrupts, but that it is magnetic to the corruptible. Enormous problems arise when human mistakes are made on the grand scale available to the superhero. Heroes are painful, 
superheroes are a catastrophe. June teaches us that people with too much power can make mistakes that have far-reaching consequences. Just look at the death of Twitter. There are also big themes of ecological preservation in Dune. The planet Arrakis and the mighty sandworms cannot be tamed by anyone seeking wealth or power, but they can be lived with through conservation and humility. There is a ton of religion in Dune. In fact, when you Google Dune, one of Google's questions is, is Dune Islamic? Good old Google questions. The theme of Jihad is used frequently throughout the Dune series, uh, in always in reference to religiously motivated wars. Just for academic interest, the word jihad literally means striving or struggle. Um, it's actually referring to working hard to be meritorious or noble. In popular culture though, it's all about religious war. Deeper into the Dune series, we see how religion can adapt itself around certain powerful individuals, even allowing for the rise of a god emperor. Dune shows us how religion can sometimes create a pathway to tyranny. But this leads me to the biggest theme of Dune. Okay, this is another one of my tangents, please forgive me, but this is one of my pet peeves around the Dune series. You see, everyone loves the whole Chosen One bit in Book 1, but no one reads the consequences of the Chosen One story that we see in Book 4. So just looking at Goodreads, Dune the First has 1.25 million reviews. God Emperor has 100,000k. That's literally less than a twelfth. Most people only read the first part where it's cool to be the chosen one. But I am the chosen one. They don't see the ultimate danger of someone gaining too much power. I think one of the reasons why people like Dune so much is we like to see ourselves as the saviour figure. Paul Atreides is a bit of a wish fulfillment character. We all want to be like Paul and ascend in power and wisdom and glory. But we never want to see the costs, the risks, the consequences, and the potential for utter disaster. Dune, like all good science fiction, is a warning of the future. We should never hero worship to the point of deifying a human being. We should never allow for one person to rise up above all others. I might just stop here before I get all political and cry out for anarchy. <laughs> I kind of want to skip this segment just once. Here's something you may not know. If the Book Guide channel ever gets a mean comment, it's about this segment. So, naturally, I include this segment in every video. <laughs> but this one's going to be a bit tricky today. You see, Dune was written in the 60s through to the 80s, so that was when representation was not really a priority for most people. Now, Frank Herbert has clearly put in a lot of effort to include representation, and that speaks very well of his intent. But it does fall short in a few places. It may just be by more modern standards. You tell me what you think, but let me put it to you this way. So the Bene Gesserats are all women. They're all powerful and wise. The all women magic group has been done a few times, like the Aes Sedai in Wheel of Time and the sorceresses in The, uh, in the Witcher. So that's a pretty good thing. And the Fremen are the indigenous population of Arrakis. They were colonized by the Empire. Uh, there's a huge amount of parallels between the Fremen and indigenous populations around the world. I love that they cast a woman of color in the most prominent role in the movie. Again, another strong move by Frank Herbert. But this is where it gets a little bit awkward. The women of the Bene Gesserit are looking for the Chosen One. As soon as a man shows up, he immediately becomes the Chosen One. And the Fremen have the prophecy about a Liberator. As soon as a white guy shows up, he becomes the chosen one. This is a white savior trope. You can't really represent women and people of color as equal to white male and then immediately have white males dominate them. It undermines the whole representation effort. Now I know I'm painting a bit of a target on my head here. People love Paul Atreides and they don't take kindly to insults to him. And I also acknowledge June once again was good representation for the time it was in. But I still think it's important to talk about how we can do better as readers, as writers, and as people. See, when Frank warned us about the dangers of the Chosen One and the dangers of power, he also told us what the solution was. This is something that he talks about a lot through the series, the uh, defense 
to the temptation of power is the ability to have self-control and self-awareness. The idea is that if you can learn to understand your own weaknesses and your own temptations, you can account for them and ultimately overcome them. So that's why I think it's important to discuss when representation misses the mark, because by understanding our weaknesses and our shortcoming, we can adapt and overcome and do better next time. And that protects us from the risk of corruption. Still, Tell me what you think of the whole white savior trope below. Be respectful, please. I think it's something that we should keep talking about. Hey, quick note, I'm just editing it and I wanna add something. There is a school of thought that actually says the whole white savior trope thing in June is done as satire. Like it was a deliberate choice to mock the whole trope. And that could be true because there is the whole satire around the chosen one trope as well. So that might have been Frank's intention, I'm not entirely sure which it was. So there is a bit of controversy around calling June a white savior novel, but read it for yourself and uh, see if you get that vibe and tell me what you think. Say hello, Esme. Oh, you are just the cutest. Oh, nope, she didn't like that. Okay, bye. <laughs> So not much of a content warning for this series. Uh, there is very little violence or sex, but there are some pretty mature themes. And there are a lot of drugs. The whole spice melange shows you tripping out, seeing the future, and having a bit of a psychedelic episode. Or relaxation, or simple pleasure. Yet overall, I don't think there's too much to freak out about in this series. Is the ending worth it? In a word, no, because there is no real ending to the Dune series. I would say that God Emperor offers the most conclusive ending in the series, but the ending in Chapter House is forever open-ended. Now, I do like to think that Frank would have written a brilliant seventh novel that would have capped it off, and what we would have seen is a arc, a, a quadrilogy of four and then a trilogy of three, and that's how we would have seen the Dune series. I also like to think that the seventh novel would have justified a lot of the setup from books five and six. But as it stands, the ending is not very satisfying. But the ending in God Emperor kind of is. <laughs> You know how you scroll through Facebook and YouTube sometimes and then you see something that reflects the private thoughts that you had in your own damn mind? Yeah, I had one of those while making this video. While I was working on this series, I was trolling through Facebook and I found this amazing meme that literally summarized my entire video. It was kind of insulting to be honest, but I'll put it up on the screen. I blanked out some offensive language, but here are your options. So if you enjoyed June, you can stop after book one. If you like Paul Atreides, read books one and two. If you like the whole cho Chosen One and the Golden Path mystery, do one to four. And if you just love June and Frank Herbert's writing, do all six. Under no circumstances should you read Brian Herbert's work. Good luck and happy reading. And we're done. That was all six books in Frank Herbert's June series. And I hope you know now which ones you want to read. So that was our first outing into Sci-Fi September. I'm excited to announce the schedule for the rest of the month. Next week, I'm doing the Broken Earth Trilogy by the amazing N.K. Jemisin. She's fantastic. It's a great series. We're going to do it next Friday. Uh, going on from there, we're going to do The Expanse, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and Red Rising. So stick around. So comment your thoughts on Dune below. Tell me which books you've decided to read or which themes you like the most. Anything, Dune's great to talk about. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. And if you really liked this video, you should uh, support us through our shop, Rainbow Space Unicorn. It's a charming little shop full of cute little magical accessories. I'll see you next week for more sci-fi. I hope you make time for a book today. I hope you are nice to other people, but even more so, I hope you're nice to yourself. See you next time. Bye.